This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Biology or Combined Science. These are pure factual recall questions based upon specification. You can download the questions from the description below and use these to make flashcards or to test yourself and then use this video to check that you know what the answers should be. Eukaryotic cells are those that contain a nucleus and other membrane bound subcellular structures. Animal cells, plant cells and yeast cells are all examples of eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are those that do not contain a nucleus. In a eukaryotic cell, the genetic information is found wrapped in a membrane, and the whole structure is called the nucleus. In prokaryotic cells, the DNA is found loose in the cell, often as a single chromosome. Some bacteria may also have plasmids, small circular pieces of DNA that are not essential to the cell's functions. Eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells, and bacteria do not have mitochondria because the mitochondria are about the size of a bacteria, having originally been bacteria themselves. Animal cells typically contain a nucleus, cytoplasm, cell membrane, mitochondria and ribosomes. In addition to this, plant and algal cells usually have a cell wall made of cellulose, a permanent vacuole and chloroplasts. The nucleus exists to control the actions of the cell and it contains the DNA. Most chemical reactions take place in the cytoplasm. The cell membrane controls the movement of substances into and out of the cell, while the mitochondria is the site of aerobic respiration. When a cell is described as specialised, this means that it's physically adapted to its function, either in its shape or in the subcellular structures that are found within that cell. Sperm cells are specialised by having a tail to move and also lots of mitochondria to provide the energy for that sperm cell to swim to the egg cell. Nerve cells are branched to allow connections to lots of other cells and also along their axon they have a myelin sheath, which is going to insulate the cell and allow a faster nerve impulse to travel. Muscle cells are specialised by having lots of mitochondria to do aerobic respiration and provide the energy for contraction. Root hair cells have a large surface area to maximise absorption of water and mineral ions and they don't have any chloroplasts because they're below the surface of the earth and therefore they can't do photosynthesis. The xylem are strengthened by a woody substance called lignin and there are no walls between the cells so the whole xylem is a hollow tube. Phloem cells have perforated ends, what we call the sieve tube elements, to allow the movement of substances from cell to cell, and there's the removal of the subcellular structures, so often they don't have lots of mitochondria and things, and instead they have a companion cell alongside that is providing them with the extra energy and things that they need. Animal cells specialise very early and then can only be that one cell type, whereas plant cells specialise much later. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells with the ability to turn into many different cell types. They are found in adult bone marrow, in embryos and in plant meristems. Bone marrow cells can differentiate into both red blood cells and white blood cells. Diabetes and paralysis can both be treated using stem cells. In therapeutic cloning, an embryo is produced that has the same genes as the patient. This then won't be rejected because it contains the same genes, so the cells have the same antigens on the surface, and so the cells aren't identified by the immune system as being pathogens. Risks of this process are the risk of viral transfer and also some ethical considerations. Plant stem cells can be used to conserve rare species or to produce clones of plants for agriculture. Magnification is how many times larger an image is than the actual object that it's based on, whereas resolution is the smallest difference between two objects that you can differentiate. The formula to connect image size, actual size and magnification is image size is actual size multiplied by magnification. It's important to use a stain because this allows us to visualise transparent structures. If an image was too small to be seen, then you would need a lens that was more powerful and could magnify things more. If you were trying to correct an image that was blurry, then you would need to focus this. Light microscopes work by passing a beam of light through a specimen and then using lenses to produce an image. The first light microscopes were in use as early as the late 16th century. 
Typically, the light microscopes that we use in school have two lenses, an objective lens and an eyepiece lens. These types of microscope are called compound microscopes. To calculate the overall magnification, you need to multiply together the magnification of the two lenses, or the power of the two lenses. Light microscopes use a beam of light, whereas electron microscopes use a beam of electrons, and this results in the electron microscope having both a higher magnification and a higher resolution. The maximum magnification of a light microscope is about 1500 times, although the ones that we have in school tend to max out at about 400 times, when you have a 10 times eyepiece lens and a 40 times objective lens. The resolution is about 0.2 micrometers. This means you can see the differences between individual cells, but you can't really see the subcellular structures. In comparison to this, an electron microscope has a much higher magnification, as much as 500,000 times or even a million times. And the resolution is down to about one nanometer. This means we can actually see individual subcellular structures and even their ultrastructure. The two types of electron microscope are a scanning electron microscope and a transmission electron microscope. Scanning electron microscopes give a larger field of view for studying surface structures, although often at a lower magnification, whereas transmission electron microscopes are used to examine thin slices of cells or tissues so we can look at the ultrastructure of subcellular structures. The nucleus contains the genetic information in a eukaryotic cell. Chromosomes are made from DNA. Genes are much smaller than chromosomes, so each one of your cells has 46 chromosomes and about 20,000 genes. Each chromosome of the human body has 46 chromosomes, apart from the gametes, which have 23. Each of these are in pairs, so you have two of each type, one from your mum and one from your dad. The cell cycle is the series of events that take place in a cell as it grows and then divides. It can be separated into interphase, where the cell is just kind of growing and doing its normal thing, DNA replication, and then cell division. The process of cell division that can take place in any cell in the body is mitosis. And the three overall stages for mitosis are firstly that the cell will grow and increase the number of subcellular structures, then the DNA will replicate, and then the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and the cell membranes will all divide to form two identical cells. Mitosis is necessary for growth and also for the development of multicellular organisms. Diffusion is the movement or spreading out of the particles of any substance that's in solution or in a gas, resulting in an overall movement from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We can also talk about this being down a concentration gradient. Definitely down, never across or along. In the human body, oxygen diffuses from the lungs into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide diffuses from the bloodstream back into the lungs. As part of excretion, urea diffuses out of cells. The speed of diffusion can be controlled by differences in the concentration gradient, the temperature and also the surface area. In the lungs, the alveoli maximise the surface area. There's a really good blood supply, so there are capillaries going to all those different alveoli and these are going to maximise the concentration gradient. And finally, there's a really short diffusion path because the wall that the um, gas exchange is happening across is only one cell thick. Likewise, in the small intestine, in the same way that the lungs have alveoli to maximise the surface area, the small intestine has villi, those small finger-like projections that increase the surface area to maximise the speed of diffusion. Again, there's a very short diffusion path, and again, there's a really good blood supply with lots of capillaries to maximise the concentration gradient. Likewise, in the gills, we have a high surface area, a short diffusion path, and a good blood supply. The roots have root hair cells all over them, which again are going to maximise the surface area for rapid diffusion. Individual cells have a really large surface area to volume ratio, and that means they don't need these same transport paths. To work out the surface area of a cube, you do 6 multiplied by length by width. In other words, 6 times the area of one side whereas to calculate volume, you would do length by width by height. You can think of osmosis as the diffusion of water across a partially permeable membrane. In other words, it's the movement of water from where there's lots of water to not very much water. And we tend to call that the movement from dilute solutions to concentrated solutions across a partially permeable membrane. 
To calculate the rate of water uptake by plant roots, you need a time because rates are all about speeds and they're all compound measures with time. So you would need to take the volume of water that was taken up and divide it by the time taken. If, as in the required practical, you put some potato cores or some other plant tissue into a very concentrated solution, then water will move from the plant cells into the solution and that will cause the plant cells to shrivel up and to get smaller and also to um, reduce in mass. On the contrary, if you put those same plant cells into a very dilute solution, then water will move from the solution into the plant cells and this will cause them to become turgid and to increase in mass and also to increase in length. To calculate the percentage change, we first need to know what the absolute change is. So that will be um, the final mass or the final length minus the initial mass or the initial length. And then you divide that by your starting mass or starting length. And then to be a percentage, you need to multiply it by 100. It's important during the required practical that you dry off the potato cores because otherwise you'd be weighing the water that they'd been in as well. And that would influence your results. Active transport is the movement of substances from a more dilute solution to a more concentrated solution. In other words, it's kind of diffusion happening in reverse. It happens across a partially permeable membrane and being called active transport, it requires energy from respiration. In order for cells to be able to carry out active transport, they need carrier proteins and they also need additional mitochondria to provide the energy from respiration to carry out the process. In the human body, we use active transport to absorb sugar molecules in the intestines. Plants also use active transport to absorb mineral ions into the plant root hairs. Two examples of mineral ions absorbed in this way are nitrate ions and magnesium ions. The nitrate ions are necessary for making proteins and the magnesium ions are necessary for making chlorophyll. We only use active transport when we need to because it's an active process and it requires energy, whereas diffusion is a passive process which doesn't cost us anything. These last three slides are only for those people taking the GCSE biology exams or the triple science exams, so if you're taking combined science you can turn off now. Bacteria divide by a process called binary fission, and this can happen as rapidly as every 20 minutes provided they have sufficient nutrients and also a suitable temperature. Bacteria can be cultured either in liquid, in a nutrient broth, or on agar plates. Uncontaminated cultures of microorganisms are necessary both for investigating the action of disinfectants and antibiotics. In all stages of the required practical, it's important to avoid contaminating your cultures with other bacteria from the environment around you. So before you begin, it's important to sterilise your petri dishes and your culture media to prevent contamination from other bacteria. And then you need to sterilise your inoculating loop to avoid contamination by other bacteria. And then you need to tape down the lid of your petri dish, both to avoid contamination of your culture with external bacteria and to avoid your bacteria getting out. Also, you store your plates upside down because condensation will form and you don't want it forming on your culture media. In school labs, we tend to culture things at about 25 degrees C, and we use this cooler temperature to prevent culturing pathogens. So all of the things that will make you ill are happiest at your body temperature of about 37 degrees C. And by using a cooler temperature, we're less likely to culture those pathogens. Provided you set up your culture properly, all of your cultures should be roughly circular. So in order to calculate the area of the colony, you can use the formula for the area of a circle, which is pi r squared. An antiseptic is a chemical that will kill bacteria or kill other microorganisms. And the zone of inhibition is the, the sort of circular area around your antiseptic disc where no bacteria are able to grow. In order to introduce different antiseptics to a colony of bacteria, what you would usually do is soak little paper discs that are all the same size in the different antiseptics and then put those on top of a culture of bacteria. To identify the most effective antiseptic, you look for the one which has the largest zone of inhibition. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this a useful video in your revision for GCSE Biology Unit 1. If you did find it useful then don't forget to like and subscribe below to receive notifications for the rest of these recall question videos and other GCSE Biology resources coming soon.